Hello, everyone, and uh, welcome back to engineering class. It's uh, good to see you. And uh, we're going to go ahead and, and forget about the robots for right now. And we, we are going to move ahead to the Arduinos. And uh, before I can get you can get your hands on one of these bad boys, and before you're, you're digging in, we've got to understand some of the basics. So today we're going to be going over the basics of circuits, how do you uh, kind of protect parts of your board? How do you understand the essentials of electricity? Um, let's go ahead and get started. Let's dig in, dig deep. Here we go. First things first, this is the unit on Arduinos. We should probably talk about what an Arduino is and um, why are we using them? So that's a good place to get started. If you want to watch a cool video, go ahead and check out the website. There's an awesome video. Uh, I'm, I'm going to post a couple of videos of just kind of small projects uh, that people have done, just average Joes, uh, average Julies. What's the the other version? Of, I don't know. Average Joes and Julies have done. And uh, also a video of something that I'd like to create at some point in the future. So check those two videos out. They should be prior to this video um, on the website if you haven't. Um, Anywho, let's go ahead and get started. What is an Arduino? Arduino is an open source electronics prototyping platform. Great. That's absolutely no help to you because that has a lot of weird phrases you may not have seen before. So let's break this down. Open source means it's free to use and to redistribute. There are a lot of things that are free to use that have the word open in front of them. For example, if you have open office, that is like a word processing program that um, uh, anyone can get. It's free. You don't have to pay for it. And uh, yeah, fantastic. Um, Minecraft, uh, people can alter and change many things. I mean, you have to, you have to pay for mine, Minecraft initially, but once you have the... Um, or at least back when it first came out, I'm, I'm off a little bit, but you could change and make your own uh, kind of customizable um, items and, and just the whole program itself was almost completely customizable. So, uh, and anything that you said that has the word open is open source, free to use, free to re redistribute. And so the, where you program for this, this program that we would, program Arduinos with is free and you can go get it yourself. Okay, it's electronic. I think you guys are good with that. It has electricity. It is a, uh, it's for prototyping. So it's where you are going to kind of make a original version. It's like where you're going to start in the development process. If you want to bring something to someone and say, look, here's my idea. This is a great way to do it. Okay. And uh, platform just means it's the hardware on which software can be run. So what an Arduino is really is it's just like a tiny computer. It's a tiny computer that you can send a program to and it's going to do that program just like your robot. And you're probably wondering, well, why not just use a robot? Because that had motors, that had sensors. Can't I just use that all the time? The answer is yes, um, but you're going to have to pay a lot more. Arduinos are really cheap. The board itself is like $25. Um, the whole kit that you have in the class is like $45 with all the components. A Lego robot is like $400. So we're talking like 10 times the, pr the price, excuse me. So it's cheap, really cheap. You can get anyone could go out and get one. Um, it can interact with so many different things. It's really, really simple. It's just a bunch of circuits that we can control lightning fast. That's what's awesome about an Arduino. Very customizable. You can, you can get parts um, all over the place. You can get really, really cheap parts and, and make almost anything that you want um, with the parts that are available. I'm talking, you know, we had for, for uh, the robots, we had what, like five sensors? I mean, you can probably get, uh, you can measure all sorts of things. Soil, moisture, temperature. If you can think of it, it's out there and it's probably less than $2 to buy the sensor. So that's why it's amazing. Um, it's also a great way to learn to code and it's a great way to learn to understand circuits. Um, 
yeah, that's pretty much it. Okay, and and if you haven't mentioned again, if you haven't had a chance to check out this guy's uh, Garduino, it's really cool. He's uh, he's got an automatic garden watering, or rather this little box system, and he goes over kind of the whole mindset of being an Arduino owner too. So that's pretty cool video if you didn't get a chance to check that out. Okay, to understand what we're doing, you need to understand what's going on at the atomic level. What is electricity? If you can't answer that right now, if you can't turn around and tell exactly what electricity is to your dog, then you need to be paying attention. Don't skip past this. This is important. Okay, atoms are made up of subatomic particles. You got your protons and neutrons in the center. You got electrons orbiting around the outside. Okay, so certain kinds of atoms, uh, well, so all the different elements have different numbers uh, of basically protons, neutrons, and electrons, or different combinations of those numbers. And um, the electrons have a negative charge, the protons have a positive charge, and the neutrons are neutral. But basically, different elements, different atoms of different elements have different, um, basically different arrangements of electrons on the outside, okay, the outside ring, and those are called valence electrons. So here's a couple different atoms. Um, and so different, basically, as this, uh, these outer shell of electrons is orbiting, you kind of get a negative charge that's one-sided around the atom. Now this is two-dimensional, it's really kind of happening three-dimensionally, but that electron is rotating around and it kind of creates this polarity uh, around the outside of the atom. So how is that, what does that have to do with electricity? Well, if, if um, something, so there's different kinds, there's conductors and there are insulators, right? So you might say like, what's something that conducts electricity? Metal, um, water. Water actually doesn't unless it has the, um, if it's like some sort of saline or has some salt that can, can pass those things, uh, the electrons through. But basically the whole idea is opposites, an opposite charge will attract and similar charges will repel each other. So what you get going on in things like conductors, like metal, copper, um, those things have this valence electron on the outside that is kind of wanting to be shared. So as the electrons are orbiting around, basically in this atom you have, um, you, when it's getting to this point, there is a gap over here on this atom and that the charge, the electron wants to jump over and um, kind of move through this, uh, the atoms of this element. So the electrons aren't necessarily just bound to one atom, they can kind of be passed back and forth. And as this outer electron is rotating, it uh, kind of recognizes the void that there isn't an electron here, and they're kind of passing electrons throughout each other, and you get this motion of um, electrons moving through the substance. Okay, and lots of things can conduct electricity. Uh, I'm not a chemist, uh, but hopefully that was somewhat of an explanation. You have valence electrons being passed um, from atom to atom, and that is electricity. And that's what we are going to talk about measuring for the rest of the lesson. Um, you may have, you know, you see on a battery, there's one side that's plus or minus, um, anode, cathode, anode, and you're going to see different diagrams calling certain things positive, the positive thing, the anode, the negative thing, the anode, and it really just depends on kind of the type of uh, the type of circuit that you're dealing with. Anode is where um, oxidation occurs, cathode is where the reduction occurs. We're not going to be talking much about this, and that's kind of above my head anyways. We're going to go uh, more into the basics of circuitry, how it flows, and this next slide will be even more helpful. So conventional current is what we're going to use in the class. Uh, it turns out that 
when people kind of formalized electricity, they all talked about things going from positive to negative, electricity flowing from positive to negative, when in actuality, the direction the electron flows is from negative to positive. Um, but we're going to be using positive to negative for all intents and purposes of this class. When I say positive and negative, I really mean um, on your Arduino, every Arduino, if I go back, and we'll, do, we'll go over this again, but every Arduino has these numbered ports. So this is kind of the positive, and then you'll see uh, some of the ports will say GND, which stands for ground. So these pins over here where the white are and this pin over here, um, those stand for ground, and the ground represents... Um, the negative side of the circuit. So numbered ports are your positive side, ground is your negative side. And I'm going to say that again um, later, so don't worry about that too much. But we'll be, we'll be talking about conventional current and using conventional current in this class. Okay, so the best metaphor that I have for you for electricity is kind of like a dam. So um, with a dam, you have this intricate system um, where uh, you have this big amount of water. This is kind of what's generating the electricity. And you have this amount of pressure that is pushing water and spinning the turbines in the, in the dam. But imagine, let's say there are no turbines and it was just a solid wall, right? Eventually, this would get really, really full. You have this electrical pressure. Um, and then you can poke a hole in the dam and then the water is going to th flow through. So you have a couple characteristics you can describe here. You can describe the amount of water behind the dam. You can describe how big the hole is that you're poking through. Um, and you can, and you know that the size of the hole is actually going to determine the rate at which water is coming out of there, right? Um, and when I, what I mean rate, I mean actually like, yeah, how fast things are coming through. Okay, so let's go ahead and take a look at this, uh, at this metaphor. So the first one, the voltage, uh, has the three things that we're going to be measuring are volts, amps, and ohms. Voltage has base units volts, okay, represented by a V. This is the amount of electrical force in the circuit, and that's represented by the um, by the water in uh, backing the dam. Okay, it's the amount of kind of pressure or force that is in a circuit. Okay, um, in terms of an actual circuit, this is usually the power source. So if it's like a battery, that is what's providing the the force. If it's in your house, it's the electrical socket. Okay, our houses. In the United States, run on uh, 120 volt all regular circuits. Do. So 120 volts is kind of like our power source. It is the force that's pushing electrons through the circuit. Okay. So the next one is amperage, aka intensity or current. Okay. It has base unit amps represented by the letter A. Um, and it is the number of electrons that flow through something per second. So that sounds to me like a rate. It's basically like how fast something is going through the hole. So if we were to poke a hole in the dam, how fast are things traveling through that hole? Okay. And so let's, uh, so one amp, just to get a, a gauge and kind of understand how fast this happens. One amp is 6.24 times 10 to the 18th electrons per second traveling through that. So if you don't know or you're not comfortable with scientific notation, how big is that? 6.24. That would be 6. Um, it's going to be 6.24 with 16, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 16 zeros after it. So I don't even know what this number is, but it is very large. That's millions, billions, trillions, quadrillions, six quintillion, 
240 quadrillion electrons per second. Um, that's a lot, okay? So, or is it, right? Electrons are really, really small. Maybe that's not that much. Let's take a look. So, um, one amp right here would be like a high-powered flashlight. So, the 6 quintillion, 240 quadrillion electrons per second is actually just the amount of... Um, the amount of electricity or the rate at which they're flowing to power a high-powered flashlight. Um, three amps is like uh, your laptop. Uh, Fifteen amps is like your microwave. That's a lot of power. And uh, 10,000 plus amps is like a lightning bolt. Um, these things up here stand for milliamps. And we're going to get into that in a little bit. But 50 milliamps is like keyboard and mouse, so kind of small. A TV remote is 10 milliamps. Like you can put in tiny little batteries and they can last for a very long time. I don't think I've ever changed the batteries in my remote um, since we bought the TV. And a uh, mobile phone and uh, currents, very, very small. Those are like microamps and it's like nanoamps or something. Very small amounts of current electricity. Okay. Okay, the last one is resistance. This is something that is opposing the current. Um, example of resistance are like, well, things called resistors that you can add to a circuit. There's also um, any sort, any, anything that uses electricity is going to provide some amount of resistance. That's like a light bulb or a microwave when it's on, not when it's off. And uh, the wire itself, if you have a long enough wire, that will also provide some resistance in the circuit. Okay, so what is the resistance in this metaphor? That would be, so the current was the rate, you know, water would be flowing through. Resistance is kind of like uh, related to the size of the hole that you're creating as it goes through. So the more resistance you apply, then the slower the water is going to be coming through the dam. Right? The less resistance you apply, the, um, the less resistance, the faster it's going to be coming through. Okay, so is there an equation that explains all this? Yes, okay. Uh, resistance is measured with the base unit ohms, um, and we represent that with the capital Greek omega. Okay, so the units for resistance are ohms. The units for current are amps, and the units for voltage are volts. Those two are pretty easy. Ohms is a little bit weirder, but that kind of looks like an O, so hopefully that'll help you remember. Okay, yeah, so Ohm's law is, is what we use to solve these kind of little um, quandaries we have when we're building and designing circuits. So the job of an electrical engineer is usually... Uh, what you need to know is if something is high voltage, um, that's not necessarily what's dangerous. It's high current or the high number of electrons that is dangerous. Like, for example, like we can take uh, 120 volt power. That's a lot, right? That's a ton of, of voltage. And we can make it charge something like a Tamagotchi for those that, uh, oh, you guys probably don't even know what that is. We can make it charge your cell phone, which is this tiny little device, but that same amount of power can also turn on a microwave. Hmm, okay, so what do we as electrical engineers do? We have a fixed voltage, and electrical engineers say, hey, we got all the voltage. We control the resistance. We design something with a certain resistance, and that resistance will control the current. So we have a fixed voltage a lot of times, and then we choose as engineers a resistance that will create the current that is appropriate for the device that we are trying to get it to use. So voltage is equal to current times resistance. Probably thinking of why, uh, why is current or amps represented by an I, not a C or an A. And that goes back to um, amperage also being called electrical intensity, the rate at which those electrons are coming you know, through the circuit. Okay, um, yeah, named after this guy. And that is pronounced Ohm's Law, for those that don't know. So before we do any calculations, you need to understand 
some of the basics here. Um, you need to know your metric prefixes if you don't already. So I'm going to go over that so we can all be successful. Let's pick red first. Go back through. All right. So um, basically, if you're in kilo amps, so one amp is our base unit. This is our base unit. Um, and, and if you're trying to go to kilo amps, kilo amp means um, kilo means thousand, and milli means one thousandth. So um, which one is more dangerous, a kilo amp or a milliamp? The correct answer is a ki one kilo amp is one thousand amps. It's a thousand times stronger. One milliamp is one one thousandth, so it's a thousand times smaller or a thousand times weaker than one amp. Remember, this is like a flashlight amount of electricity. Okay, so how do I go between them? So if you're going from kilo amps to amps or from amps to milliamps, you multiply by 1,000. You might be thinking like, why are these numbers bigger if they're weaker? Well, that's like um, one foot versus 12 inches. They're both the same, right? But there are, since inches are smaller, there are more of them than there are feet in a distance, right? So they're smaller units, so we should have more of them. Okay, these are bigger units, so we should have less of them. So to convert between kiloamps to amps, you times by a thousand. From amps to milliamps, you times by a thousand. So what do we do to go this direction? We divide by a thousand going the opposite direction. And divide by a thousand again. Okay, so that's how we convert. So let's take a look at this problem here. If we have four kilo amps, four kilo amps is equal to, but well, we're going to the right, which means we, so these are the bigger units. We're going from a bigger unit to a smaller unit. Four kilo, kilo amps is a thousand amps. And a thousand amps times by a thousand again is equal to a million milliamps. Fantastic. All right. In blue. Swing. Here we go. All right. Back over to here. In blue. We're starting now with millivolts. So it actually works. Uh, milli means 1,000th. Kilo means um, 1,000. So basically, if we have 8,756 millivolts and we go on and go to volts, we're going from a small unit to a larger unit, so we divide by 1,000. So the correct answer is 8.756 volts. So 8,756 millivolts is 8.756 volts. We divided by 1,000, okay? If we divide by 1,000 again, that's the same as moving the decimal place over three places, you get 0 0.008756, and this is kilovolts. So many kilovolts we have. Okay, last one in green. We have the base unit. The base unit is um, ohms, and so uh, how do we write that in milliohms? Well, we're going this direction, so we times by a, uh, a thousand. That would be 330,000. 330 times a thousand is 330,000 milliohms. Great. And then going this direction, um, three, uh, 330 ohms, we would divide by a thousand to get 0 0.33 kilo ohms. Okay? So um, that's how we convert. Why is this important? Because sometimes electricity is listed in, there are actually many, many different kinds of uh, metric prefixes that you could use to express electricity. These are the most common ones. So let's take a look at a couple examples here. It says a circuit with 120 volt power supply is drawing half an amp across a device. How much resistance
is the device providing in the circuit, okay? So we always start with Ohm's law, which is V equals IR, or voltage equals current times resistance. And now we're going to plug in for the things that we have to try and find the things that we want. So it says a circuit with 120 volt power. Oh, that's like our house. So 120 goes here. Um, and you always got to make sure that this is in volts, this is in amps, and this is in ohms before you do your math. Okay, 120 volts is right there, equals the current. Well, do we know that? Yeah, it says amps, so I'm going to put in parentheses 0 0.5 amps times the resistance, and it says how much resistance. And since it says how much resistance, we know that that is just remains as an R because that's our unknown. Now we um, divide both sides by 0 0.5. Schwing, let's see here. 120 divided by 0 0.5. 0 0.5. The resistance is 240 ohms. We know it's in ohms because this is in amps and that was in volts. And that's how you should do your work on your assignment. So start with your equation. Plug in the things that you know, show the math, these cancel. Uh, 120 divided by 0.5 is 240. Okay, next one. Find the voltage across the circuit with 330 ohms of resistance and 20 milliamps of current. So we start again with V equals I times R. Find the voltage. So that means we don't know this, and we're, we're using these two to find it. 330 ohms of resistance, so it's not always in the correct order. Okay, what's the current? 20 milliamps. Oh, 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 I saw what you were going to do. You were going to write 20. Can't write 20 because 20 is in milliamps, and I said this has to be in amps. So we have to go off on the sign and do a little conversion. Okay, 20 milliamps is the smaller unit, so we have to divide by 1,000 to get it into amps. 20 divided by... 1,000 is equal to 0 0.02, okay? So this is 0 0.02 amps times the resistance, which is in ohms, of 330. Okay, now this will give us the voltage, okay? And we can multiply across here. We get the answer, 6.6 .6 volts. Bingo. No solving required. We just had to multiply. Last one. A standard 5 millimeter uh, LED can be ruined uh, if they experience a current higher than 20 milliamps. If a hook, if if I hook up a 9-fold battery to a circuit with 150 ohm resistor, is the LED likely to be ruined? Okay, this is why we're doing this, by the way. If you use the wrong kind of resistor in your circuit when you're building circuits, um, you're likely to fry parts of the circuit. So we don't want to do that. We want to be able to do our calculations ahead of time. So we start again with V equals I times R. Voltage, 9. 9 volt battery, okay? Okay, and I saw what you were doing there. You were going to plug in 0 0.02 or 20 for this. Don't do that because it says this is the boundary for when they are ruined, right? We want to know we are using a 9 volt battery with a 150 ohm resistor, and we want to know what the, if we do that, we want to know what the current's going to be. And if it's bigger than 20, then we've got a problem. So let's go ahead and plug this in. 9 times I times the resistance, which is in 150. So to get uh, I by itself, we divide both sides by 150. And you'll get I is equal to 9 divided by 150, which is... Zero point zero six. So what's the result? Is it going to fry our LED or not? Well, we got to be careful. This is in volts. This is in ohms. So this is in 
amps. If this is in amps and that's in milliamps, we got to convert. So uh, we're in the bigger unit. We want to go to the smaller unit. So we multiply by 1,000, which means we get 60 milliamps. So do we fry our LED? Yes, we have 60 milliamps going through the circuit. 150 ohms of resistance is not enough. If you want to decrease the current, we are going to have to increase the resistance. If we increase the resistance, then we divide by a bigger number, um, which means this gets smaller, which means our current gets smaller. So if you have a fixed voltage, you want to decrease the current, increase the resistance. Okay. If you want to increase the current, you decrease the resistance. Hopefully uh, that makes sense. Hopefully this has been helpful. Hopefully you learned something. This is our first lesson. Um, hopefully I'll see you guys in the live session later this week. And I uh, really appreciate you watching, watching uh, and washing your hands. That was smooth. You see what I did there? Okay. Have a good day.